One of my very favorite professors at Houston Baptist University, Dr. Lou Marco, scholar and resident, Robert H. Ray, Chair in Humanities, Professor of English. While at the University of Michigan, he specialized in British Romantic poetry. His dissertation was on Wordsworth, literary theory and the classics. And you are really well known for, gosh, C.S. Lewis, Ancient Greece, Ancient Rome, Dante, the list goes on and on and on. One of the things that attracted me to Houston Baptist, I've been here 26 years now, believe it or not, is that you get to be a generalist. I have my specialization, 19th century Victorian romantic poetry, but like my role model, C.S. Lewis, we need more generalists. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I've got something wrong with my eyes, I want to go to a doctor who's an eye specialist. I want an engineer who's a specialist. But in the humanities, we've over-specialized. We don't need these experts. We need people that have a breadth and a depth of knowledge across the Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman uh, legacy. And HBU inspires that interdisciplinary approach. It inspires teachers that are part of the great conversation. And that's one of the things that attracted me, and I've only seen that increase over my years here. Well, 26 years. I mean, Dr. Sloan has said so many affectionate things about you to me and so many others. I mean, you have, you are highly regarded here, and, and you're such a quick wit. You're, you're such an intellect. I mean, uh, let's start with Lewis. I mean, how did you get attracted to him? What was it about Lewis? Well, I have a very interesting story, even testimony. I grew up, my, my, all of my grandparents came from Greece, right? And, and we're I, in Greece. They're from Sparta, mostly. Okay. And in fact, Lewis, if I'd been born in Greece, my name would have been Leonidas, as in the leader of the 300 Spartans. Sure. And yet, by nature, I'm certainly more of an Athenian, but I am actually a Spartan, <laughs> right? And so I grew up and came to know Christ in the Greek Orthodox Church. Sure. Uh, and our priest, who was very straight, in fact, he even used the word born-again Christian of himself, because this is the 70s. Uh, and when we graduated from one Sunday school to the next, instead of giving us the typical presents, I remember being given mere Christianity and screw tape letters. So I read it very early, and I find it really helped, not only helped me to understand Christianity, but a certain way of understanding it. And then during my college years, I was a member of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and College at where? I went to Colgate University, okay. all secular schools, and then I went to the University of Michigan. Yeah. I didn't really know what a Christian school was, really, right. growing up. And it was really being part of a small group Bible study. I've, I lead a small group Bible study at my home here for HBU the whole time I've been here. And so I really grew, and then God slowly moved me more into the evangelical world. I'm, I'm specifically at a Baptist church, but I think of myself more as an evangelical. Yes. Uh, but moved me in there. But then by making me a C.S. Lewis scholar, I have spoken for every denomination you can imagine. Sure, I've yeah. even had long email dialogues with Mormons right now, of course, their sure. theology. But interestingly, Mormons respect C.S. Lewis. So I've been able to witness to Mormons through C.S. Lewis because they respect him as well. And of course, people in the secular community respect him. And I speak often at the Museum of Fine Arts. I find that, I speak in Montrose, right? This is the very secular liberal yeah. part of Houston. But I find if you ask the big questions, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? If we avoid some of the jargon words that scare them, yes. we can build a bridge. And Absolutely. I learned that partly from C.S. Lewis, how to build a bridge, find common ground. We all, have, we all understand there's a moral ethical code. We may not want to admit it, but we all understand it. We all have a desire and yearning for meaning. Right. Look, even though our modern world is supposed to be existentialist, right? And what does that mean? It means we just exist and we make up our meaning as we go along. But people may say they believe that, but the vast majority of people believe what we as Christians believe, that we were born with a purpose and part of our job is to figure out that purpose. And I don't care if they say they're secular. Most people in America want to know what that purpose is. And you know what's funny? Some of my best audiences, I, I also have done lecture series with a teaching company, some of my best audiences are engineers, doctors, lawyers, businessmen in their 60s or 70s. These are people who sure. miss the humanities yes. and now like the man you just spoke to. They're entrepreneurs, they're, but now they realize with age and experience that, you know, it's good to make money, it's good to help the community, but there are questions that I need to start dealing with even if I'm a believer already. And so I find that they're more hungry to learn about Homer, Virgil, Dante, Milton. They're more hungry than often the English professor is mm -hmm. at a secular school. 
So I just love that, that wider <coughs> witness, and HBU is part of our 10 pillars. It's reaching the community. No question about it. You know, I read McGrath's biography of Lewis, mm -hmm. and then we filmed with him in Oxford not long ago, and I've been to the kilns, and you know, not nearly immersed like you are. Talk to Michael Ward when okay. we were in Oxford right. too. Uh, what I mean, what was it about Lewis? I mean, this this cigar <laughs> yeah, smoking I know. guy. I know, I know. That, he's, he's he's the closest we Baptists have to a saint. I know. I, lo know? I love how Baptists I quote know. Lewis all the time, it's but they something. probably would have been revolted I by him but, one on fact, one. I'll tell you a fun story that I heard from. Uh, uh, <laughs> he wouldn't have passed the oh, yeah. code. Well, here, here, here's here's a funny story that, that, that that's a true story. Walter Hooper was sort of his American secretary at the end of his life. He's yeah, edited. Sure. Maybe you've met him, but he tells a story that one day he and Lewis were walking along Oxford. And there was a beggar, and Lewis gave him, you know, a pound or whatever. And as they walked away, the American said to Lewis, "Aren't you afraid that he'll use that money for drink?" And Lewis said, "Well, if I kept it, I'd probably <laughs> use it for drink." I mean, and this is our Baptist saint. Isn't that funny? But you know what he had? I mean, a few things. First of all, he was an atheist for the first half, like Lee Strobel, who teaches for HBU, right, like, sure. like Josh McDowell, yeah. uh, Chuck Holson, Gary Habermas. Yeah, Gary Habermas. I mean, here, here was somebody who. Right, he, he said it himself, I'm writing books I wish I could have read when I was an atheist. Yeah. Somebody that would not, Lewis believed in the Bible, but he understands that many of his readers don't. You need to find common ground, then draw them to the Bible. Because how, how are you going to tell them about Christ if they don't believe in God? Right. So you find common ground. That was something he did. Did you read McGrath's biography? It is very good. It okay. is very good, yeah. Uh, did, did Lewis have a relationship with his friend's mother? Again, we don't know. Nobody can prove that. I couldn't but understand I will that tell part you that book. this is going to sound like a weird thing, but let me explain. If it turned out that he might have had a sexual relationship early on, you know, I might almost have more respect for him. Now let me explain right. why. Okay, yeah. Lewis was not a believer; he was an atheist. Right. But once he became a Christian, he took care of that woman for the rest of his life. Right. And I'm wondering. I don't, I don't, again, yeah. no, nobody knows, but. You know, once he became a Christian, he might have thought, well, if there was a, it would have been brief in the beginning, if there was, I'm responsible. Right. And you know what's funny? It was after she died, the, the woman, Mrs. Moore, her name was, that he got more serious with Joy and eventually married her. Right. Now again, you know. The, and the, with the, Joy, you know, yeah. with Joy, uh, who was an American citizen, right. he married to get, yeah. uh, to give her citizenship, to get away from, Great I story. think, from a pretty nasty husband. Yeah. But what's, was. Was it love at first? It was not. It, it was done as a duty like to help Is it like the Anthony Hopkins it, it movie really is. It, that is, I mean, you know, they, they change things, but the, the basic Land. story is true. Now, there's also a BBC version, a TV movie, that's a little more true than the Anthony Hopkins one. But the basic story is true. Lewis did that solely, but then she got cancer, and he slowly realized that he really did love her. And he had the marriage ceremony, expecting her to die. Miraculously, she was healed. They had three years together. It's almost like Lewis wrestled with everything, yeah. except you know, love between the sexes. And, I and will, God gave it to him at the yeah. end. You know, uh, it's Shadowlands. I'll it's never forget watching that with my wife. I mean, it, it, we cried. Oh, I yeah. mean, it was, and I don't cry often in movies, but it was a very emotional yeah. moment. You know, and then a grief observed yeah. comes out of it. Oh, it's great, and, and you know that, that. I would say that that's the best book to read for a Christian on grieving, not just because it's C.S. Lewis, but the way that was written. When Joy died, Lewis started keeping that journal with no intention of publication. He only kept the journal. Then after he'd filled up four journal books, he thought, this might help other people. And so he published it anonymously at first. Now, why is it the best book on grieving? Let's be honest. If you or I did this, right, before we published it, either because we wanted to or because our publisher forced us to, we would go back and tidy up those early sections to make them sound less grieving, right? Even if we didn't do it to protect our image, our publisher would make us. Right. What we have here is Lewis's real grief. And you know, we have this idea that a Christian shouldn't grieve. Actually, the one that shouldn't grieve is the atheist. If you're an atheist, all you've got is survival of the fittest. Why do you grieve? We're Christians. We know this is, so to speak, plan B. This is not the way. We were not meant to die. So as Christians, we should grieve. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Now, we have the final hope, but Lewis allows us to see. He never, he, Lewis said, he never doubted God's existence, but in the grief, you start wondering, 
maybe God's not so nice as he says, right? That, that's what you struggle sure. with. I, I, I sure. would sooner deny my own existence than God, but when we go through tough periods, we start wondering, is he the loving God he says? Is he caring? Is he involved? That's what, and that's why it's so helpful because we move with him through that grief to a higher faith. Now, if you were giving an unbelieving friend a book of C.S. Lewis, don't begin with the grief observer. Right. Right. You begin right. with screw tape letters, mere Christianity, great divorce. You, you save that for later. Right. But it is a, a book that is very helpful for anyone, especially a Christian going through the grieving process. Uh, and another thing about the Inklings, you know, I've been stood outside the Eagle and Child, oh, the pub there, that oh, Tolkien and he would go have a beer and talk and. And um, is it true that Tolkien would have never wrote Lord of the Rings? McGrath paints this right. scene that, that, that someone in the group, you know, Tolkien read a little bit of right. his deal and said, oh, done. that's no good. And that Lewis said, shut up. Right, yep. And said, keep reading. Keep reading. I mean, okay, he, he might have written the Lord of the Rings without Lewis. He was writing it. Lewis did not inspire him in any of the details. What Lewis did is convinced him to keep writing it, to finish it, and to get it published. There was a long period when there were only two fans of The Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis and uh, Tolkien's son, Christopher, who's still living. He's about 90 years old and yeah. you know, has edited everything. Yeah. Uh, and the Inklings were there, but Lewis was the one that encouraged him, finish this, you have got to publish it. And when it was published, Lewis wrote a lot of the early uh, reviews. Right. And again, Tolkien got a lot of flack. You know, because here he is, a professor writing popular literature. A lot right, of people exactly. think that all of the flack Lewis got from Oxford, because you, you know, Lewis he, never got what yeah. we would call tenure at Oxford. No, he didn't. But it wasn't just because he wrote Christian books. That was part of it. It was because he dared to write popular books for the common man, that, and, and he dared to write theology books when he wasn't a theologian, right? He wasn't, even Tolkien gave Lewis a hard time. Leave that to the theologians, Jack, right? But, but no, Lewis wrote on every subject, and thank God he did because he spoke directly. His work is not easy, but it's accessible. Yes. It's not filled with jargon. You, you know, you've seen a lot of theology books today. You can't understand them unless you, and, and half of it's in German anyway. Right. It, it's almost like they have to have all these German notes because they're <laughs> embarrassed that maybe the Holy Spirit inspired them. It, it's crazy, but it's not accessible. The same thing in my field of, of, of literature. I mean, nobody understands it, but other PhDs in that field. Lewis wrote in a direct, and the other thing about Lewis, he brought together reason and imagination in a way that nobody has done. Yes. Right? I mean, we have great we have great apologists like, you know, Josh McDowell and, 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 and Lee Strobel, but we tend Americans, we tend to focus on the, the logical, rational side. We're not so much into the heavy duty imagination. Yes. Lewis brought the two together. Uh, Francis Schaeffer did a little bit of that, but nobody Nobody's been quite like Lewis in bringing it together and speaking to the whole person. Now, is it true that on the walks that Tolkien and right. Lewis had, that that um, Tolkien brought Lewis to faith or vice versa? It really versa? did. I mean, Tolkien and played Tolkin a pivotal was a, role. A, a Catholic, Strong was Roman he not? Catholic, yes. believing Roman Catholic. Yeah. Right. See, okay, again, almost everybody listening to this probably knows that Lewis was an atheist before he became a Christian. Right. What a lot of people don't know is that Lewis was not like Josh or Lee. He didn't go directly from atheism to Christianity. First, Lewis became a theist, a believer in God. It took him another year to year and a We used to say two years. Alistair McGrath showed us it was really a year. But it was at least a year before he became a believer. What was holding him back? One of the things holding him back is Lewis, like myself, was an English professor who loved mythology. I teach mythology yes. all the time. I was just yes. like teaching mythology. Yes. And he knew from reading a man named Sir James Fraser, The Golden Bow. That's not yes. a name known today, but most people know about a man named Joseph Campbell and the hero of A Thousand yes. Faces. Very similar kind of person who compared all the world religions and mythologies and discovered that almost every ancient culture has a story, a strange story, about a god coming to earth, somehow dying, dealing with taboo guilt, and returning. Now, nobody has an actual resurrection, but it's a basic story, and they call it the Corn King because it's tied to the cycle of the corn. Corn is what the word that British used to mean wheat. <laughs> Confusing. So the corn king is the wheat king. It's the cycle of you know, life, death, and rebirth. And if you're a, an, a, an Egyptian, you call this guy Osiris. If you're a Greek, you call him Adonis or Bacchus, right? right? If you're Babylonian, you call him Tammuz. Tammuz is mentioned in the Old Testament. Right. If you're Persian, you call him Mithras. If you're a Norseman, you call him Balder. So Jesus thought, like, like Joseph Campbell and many today, that Jesus is just the Hebrew version of the corn king. 
And so Lewis said, what, what do I care about a rabbi that died 2,000 years ago? And this ago? is the, art, the atheist mantra. It still uh, is today. Mantra. Yeah, it yeah, still is. I've heard it Until a lot. you just said they had a long walk. It's called Addison's Walk. It's an old deer park. It's beautiful. You can walk around it at Maudlin College, which is the way the British say Magdalen. Maudlin, as in Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Going out. Why they say that, I don't know. But anyway, we're still, we're still trying to teach those guys how to pronounce <laughs> well, English. Well, process. We're, we're and yeah, we're, they got lots of words in teaching. You know, they say Gloucesters <laughs> and Gloucester. Why? <laughs> Who knows? But, anyway, <laughs> but as they walked around. I hope no what Brits are listening to us. I hope they're not listening. We love them. We, we love them. <laughs> yeah. you know, we forgive. They don't even know how to use a semicolon, no, but we yeah. still love you and we forgive you. Uh, <laughs> and their food's not that great. Oh, they go ahead. You know, I always talk about how these great British sailors, you know, in the Renaissance, they sent ships all over the world to bring back expensive and, and you know, exotic uh, spices from all over the world. They brought them back to England and they don't use them in their food. <laughs> so what are you going to do? If it wasn't for those Indians in London, there would be no spice. But, but anyway, but we love them. We do love them. Right? It's great. But, but, but anyway, as they walked around and around, finally Tolkien said to Lewis, Jack is his nickname, he said, Jack, did you ever wonder Maybe the reason Jesus sounds like a myth is because he's the myth that became fact, the myth that came true. Wow. I mean, just think about it. We're all made in the image of the same God. God put in us a desire for this. We all know it. Now, in all the mythologies, it only takes mythic form, sometimes violent mythic form. But guess what? When God actually does it historically in history under Pontius Pilate, doesn't it make sense he does it in a way that not only fulfills the Jewish law and prophets, but fulfills all the yearnings of the pagan people. Amen. And that's suddenly Lewis realized that Christ is the savior of the world, fulfills everything. All of it reaches up to find its fullness. That's why at HBU, we want to bring Athens and Jerusalem together. Couldn't agree more. And Dr. Sloan's Ten Pillars vision is just a stunning piece. It's of... what I've been praying for. And then when he came, I said, oh my gosh, you know, we're waiting and waiting. Uh, and then it did happen. But it happened in God's timing. A great, great leader. Um, one of the things, too, that I wanted to ask you is Poets Corner at Westminster is it true that Michael Ward was a real catalyst. It is true. He's the one the that In the inclusion pushed it of yep. Lewis being in Poet's Corner. And he is in Poet's Corner. Now, they don't move his body. Right. right. But there is now a plaque And so can you explain there. what yeah. Poet's it's, Corner it's and all okay. that is? Poet's Corner is, is an area of Westminster Abbey where many of the great poets and writers and Joseph Dickens, Dickens is there. And even people like Handel, you know, yes. the author of the Messiah, are there. It, it's, it's the most prestigious place to be. And a lot of people... And are their bones actually there? Some are, some aren't. Right. There are a lot where their bones are actually there, like Handel, and I'm pretty sure Dickens is actually there. Others... You know, they didn't move the body. They, like Shakespeare, for instance, his body is in Stratford upon Avon. Right. But there is a plaque for him. So it, it is, it is the, the place of honor for British men of letters, if you want to yeah. use the more general thing, right? And again, Lewis's body is, is in Oxford. But it's a beautiful, it's a circular thing that's got his name and date. But when Michael Ward, I was just talking to him, Michael Ward chose the, the, the verse, I should say the sentence, from Lewis's work. What, what can we put to sum up Lewis? And there's a wonderful thing Lewis said. He said, I believe in Christianity just as I believe in the risen sun, not only because I can see it, but because by it I see everything else. Wow. And that's what Houston Baptist is about now. It is not just about the Christian gospel, although that's the center. It is about the Christian worldview. At the center is the gospel of Christ. But we believe, as all Christian but people for a long time, that Christianity is a worldview that has something to say about every single subject and matter of life. That's what we're presenting. Well, and in our current Pillars magazine, we have an excerpt from David Brooks, oh, New York okay. Times columnist, who wrote Road to Character. And uh, I was in Washington, D.C. with Michael Cromatory, oh, yeah. who's fighting cancer now, and he's ethics and, of religion and public policy. He started with That's Colson right. years ago. And um, Michael told me that David Brooks had received Christ. Oh, and his wife, he's Jewish, so his wife, you know, has left oh. him. And he wrote oh. Road to Character, and then he gets on this tour speaking in I, the Ivy League schools, but then he goes to the Christian universities. And in the current Pillars magazine, March 2017, I want you to be sure to see it. I just got it in the mail. I will look for it. <laughs> he says, you Christian universities have something no one else oh, has. Wow. It's true. And it is true, isn't it, Lou? And it's not just purpose and meaning. We have, we, we have a touchstone against which we can measure things. 
Yes. Otherwise, I'm sorry, if, if, if all there is is evolution, then you, you cannot get to the idea of the inherent integrity and dignity of every human being. You, you simply, that is incompatible. If we're, if we're just a product of survival of the fittest, then we don't have inherent equal dignity with everybody else. No, and nor do we have uh, the respect for humanity. We don't, we don't. The true humanism is true Christianity. And I like to refer to myself as a Christian humanist, humanist Christian, that we bring them together yes. here at HP. That's what it means to bring Athens and Jerusalem. Athens, humanism, uh, Christi uh, uh, Jerusalem, Christianity, and they come together. And you know, again, you know there's the endless debate about our founding fathers. Is the document Enlightenment or Christian? Well, there would have been no Enlightenment without Christianity. Right. Because the Enlightenment is based upon an idea, first of all, that we can trust our reason. If, if, again, if all we are is a product of evolution, then why can we trust our reason? Why should I trust these cells? It's just random flashes, yes. right? Yep. And again, this idea of justice and innate dignity, again, you can't get that anywhere but from Christianity. Absolutely. Judaism, but of course, Judeo-Christian. Now, I want you to pray for me. In about four weeks, I'm going to be in Ooh. Oxford filming with Richard Dawkins. Oh, and wow. then I'm filming with Richard Swinburne. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's one of the, the new Christian philosophers. Yes. Yeah. In in the same week. What? Now, are you debating with us? Uh, no, what I'm, are you doing? I'm filming them for a documentary we're doing on the rise of the nuns. Oh. And so N O N E S. Oh, oh, oh! I see. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah and, the uh, unaffiliated. Yeah. And so Dawkins has finally come our way after uh, we've filmed with about a hundred and two to date. Right. And, He's getting on the oh, bandwagon now. Just before we close, I want to make sure we mention your mm -hmm. books, the title of your books. Oh, gosh, I've got 13 to this day. Okay. I'll, I'll mention and, the and ones so that are... first, the website, Lou oh, Marcos. Lou Marcos, which is L-O-U-M-A-R-K-O-S. Right. At HBU. Uh, uh, no, LouMarcos.com. Right. That, 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 and that will take you to my HBU right. website, LouMarcos.com. And on my, web, on my webpage, you'll see a link to Amazon. So some, of, some of the books that, that I've done that, that are the most popular are... From Achilles to Christ, Why Christians Should Read the Pagan Classics. Good, And it's been good. very popular with homeschoolers, classical Excellent. Christian schools, right? I've got one called Apologetics for the 21st Century. And it deals with apologetics, you know, an overview of everything with Crossway. Uh, and then I've got another one that's, that, that, that people like is On the Shoulders of Hobbits, The Road to Virtue with Tolkien and Lewis. Oh, wow. Those have probably been the most... I've got to read and, that. Then, and, then, and then I've got a children's book called The Dreaming Stone in which my children become part of Greek mythology and learn that Christ is a myth made fact. Like Lion, the Witch, and the Warrior, it has levels of meaning. Mm. And the sequel's coming out summer or fall in the shadow of Troy, where they become part of the Trojan War. Cool. And the Iliad, the Odyssey, basically. So again, like Lewis, I try, I, I write two kinds of books. Some of the books I write are very specifically Christian or apologetical. Other are about literary, heaven and hell, visions of the afterlife in the Western point of tradition, where it's literary, but it is undergirded by a Christian worldview. And I sort of learned that from Lewis. Lewis wrote Preface to Paradise Lost. He wrote a lot of academic books, but they're accessible and undergirded by Judeo-Christian worldview. And then he wrote The Straight Apologetics. And so I try to do both and balance between the two. You've had an amazing gift. Well, thank you. Uh, Lou Marcos lives in Houston with his wife Donna, his son Alex, and his daughter Stacy. A great gift to Houston Baptist University. A true honor to serve alongside you. And we look forward to everything that's going to come from you in the days ahead. Thank you for stopping Thanks by so talking to us. Great talk to you. Thank you.